بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم تسليما على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم لا علمنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت حكيم عليم انشع علينا رحمتك وانزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والاكرام uh, for those that are following on zoom i realize the video or the audio setup is not as usual our computer system here decided to do a firmware update so that's going to take a while so until then we'll just have to uh, tolerate the the video and the audio that we, that we have available for now inshallah but hopefully you'll, you'll be able to follow along if there's any issue i'll be checking in the chat and then you can let me know inshallah so with that said we'll jump into surah al-bayna because this is a very very hard surah and it's a very very dense surah there's a lot to the tafsir so much has been written about surah al-bayna in contrast to surah zalzala which is pretty straightforward and pretty simple so we're going to jump right in but it also it contains a lot of deep meaning because it's one surah that synthesizes a lot of different topics a lot of different issues so we talked about surah al-alaq which talks about the beginning of revelation we talked about surah al-qadr which talks about how the revelation began and surah al-bayna talks about the essence of the revelation and the impact of that revelation once it came down and the tafsir of this surah is the reason that it's so hotly contested is because this surah does not uh, sit in one particular category even the the main question you know you say the surah you say is it makki makki or madaniya right so that's like the first thing that's listed even in some parts it's written down the scholars couldn't agree as to whether this is a makki surah or madani surah the majority said it's a madani surah and that's based on the textual evidence from the sahaba they um, people said that it's madani because of the style but actually the textual evidence is the opposite from the sahaba which indicates that it's makki so the, so then that suggests that the only reason the scholars thought that it's madani is because it talks about ahlul kitab about the people of the book so there's a way to reconcile this if you're going to say okay why is the subject matter dealing with the people in makkah um is the period of makkah but then it's talking about the people of the book so it makes more sense it should be the late period of makkah so that's what i would suggest is that it's probably late makki period perhaps early madani period but late makkah makes the most sense and there are some uh, examples that support this surah al-isra and surah al-kahf right? i think the the 13th and 14th chapters of the quran and right in the uh, before the middle of the quran they're both makki surahs and both surahs deal with ahl kitab they deal with people of the book surah al-bayna the word bayna means the clearest truth but al-bayna is like the clearest truth something which allows a person to discern the truth and the word that complicates it is not al-bayna because everybody agrees okay what al-bayna means but actually the word that complicates the matter is munfakina lam yakun alladhina kafaru min ahli al-kitab wal mushrikeen munfakina right so that they are not going to believe right munfakina so what does that mean um so those who uh believe disbelief from the people of the book and the people who associate partners the mushrikeen have separated and cut themselves off so in fakka fakka means to free a slave and it means that actually you can say in fakka al-adam right you can say that the bone has in fakka it means that it has been dislocated right and that's what we use in, in english or medical term term you would say it's been separated completely dislocated it's dislodged and separate so it, it suggests that they have separated themselves they have cut themselves off so what is it that they have cut themselves off from because munfakina but it says alladhina kafaru min ahli alkitab wal mushrikeen so it, so some people have said no well, it doesn't make sense to say that the they separated themselves by disbelieving does that make sense if if we said some of the disbelievers have separated themselves from the other disbelievers so you can't say they separated themselves by disbelieving because all the other people are also disbelieving they must have done something different 
Is everybody following what I'm saying? So Munfakina, so there, there you have this body of people who disbelieve from among two groups, uh, from the people of the book, and you have from the uh, mushrikeen, from those who ascribe partners, and they have dislodged themselves, they have separated themselves from the group, they've cut themselves off. So what does it mean? So a second possible meaning is that these people would not discontinue or stop what they were doing until the clearest proof came to them. So this is the traditional understanding, which is that they actually changed and went to belief after the clear proof came to them. Right? So this is one possibility. But it doesn't mention what they quit doing. So some people said, okay, it might be disbelief. But that doesn't make sense in the context because obviously it's talking about people who are actually transgressing even more than the main group. Not people who are cutting themselves off from the disbelievers by entering into belief. Especially when you read the second ayah, Rasulullah talks about who, what the bayana is. What is the clearest proof? That is Rasul, the Messenger wasallam. So as we mentioned in Fikak, um, it means to, to free a slave, to dislocate. Imam al-Wahid, so we'll talk about some of the possibilities. He said this ayah is the most difficult ayah that is found in the entire Quran that we're trying to you know, approach right now. And that's because of the sequence and the structure and also because of the variety of interpretations. And it has confused even the greatest scholars. Because every time you think of, oh, maybe it means this, then you get stuck. Well, but that doesn't match. Right. You know, so there's some. It has to all fit together. So we'll talk about all the possibilities, and I'll give you what I think makes the most sense. Then there is the second thing. So Munfakina is the first problem. The second problem is hatta until. And those who've studied fiqh, you know about this word hatta. Every time you you try to deal with legal rulings, those prepositions drive you crazy. Okay, like when. Like even in the time of Fajr, people talk about, oh, when is Sari, when is Suhur? So some people, they stop eating like an hour before, half, some people half an hour. Some people, they wait, okay, five minutes. Then some people, they're in the middle of the event, they're still going. <laughs> so everybody seems to be on a different page about, about Suhur time. And that's because Allah says, wa kulu wa hatta that eat and drink hatta until until it becomes clear to you. So that means that meant something different to all different people. So it's very different. The word hatta until is very different from the English language, right? Because hatta in, in, in English, I mean, until in English has to do with a certain duration. So we did it until. So that means there was an occurrence, there was an event. And then when that occurrence happened, then, then, then there was a change, right? And then something else happened. And then it was the case. But they said, some of the scholars, they said, well, if we adopt that approach, it doesn't make sense because the revelation came down and they didn't stop because Allah says they won't stop until the clear proof comes to them. So as Zamakhshari, he has one of the famous interpretations of the, of the Quran. I would caution everybody from taking his opinion as to other matters because he's a Mu'tazila scholar. So his aqidah, his belief system is based on Greek philosophy. So in case if anybody says, oh, Imam is quoting Zamakhshari, right? We're quoting him for tafsir. His tafsir is one of the best. And it's recognized by all of the great scholars, but we don't go to him for a lot of other things because he's a Mu'tazila scholar. So he doesn't follow Ahlul Sunnah. But his linguistic analysis, I mean, he was brilliant, partly because he's a philosopher, he's an expert in language, in the Arabic language, very analytical mind, um, very deep perception, so it's very beneficial. So he's saying Allah is elaborating on the stance of those who disbelieve, and in fact, it comes in the form of a statement, but it's actually a question. Are they saying that they will never leave until a clear proof is coming to them? And actually, there were challenges in other verses. They said, we will not believe, right, until unless there is a table spread of food that comes down. In another verse, like in Surah Al-Arman, there are a few examples. And then also in Surah Al-Isra, we're not going to believe in you until you break from the ground a spring for us. Um, or you make a garden 
from palm trees and grapes and and the rivers, they gush forward in force and abundance. Or you make the heaven fall upon us in, in, uh, in fragments as you claim. Or you bring Allah and the angels before us. So there are so many challenges that are related in the Quran, in Surah Ali Amran, in Surah Al Isra, or you have a house um, from gold, or you ascend into the sky. And even then, we will not believe in your ascension until kitab al until you bring us a book that we're able to read. So they need to, it's not enough that the Quran is from Allah. They want to see the book come down from the heaven. Right? And then Allah says, say, exalted is my Lord, was I ever but a human messenger. Right? And this is very important, especially in the, in the time of Rabi al-Awwal, some people are prone to exaggeration about the Prophet And You know, our position in Ahl al-Sunnah is that we don't need to exaggerate about the Prophet because he's already the best of all creation. So we don't have to add any praise to him, which is or ascribe any divinity to him, which is not suitable because he's already the best. So you don't have to add any more. But of course, you know, some people, they, they ascribe, you know, if the Prophet ﷺ performs a miracle, it's through Allah's permission. If he knows something about the future, it's through Allah's permission. If the fact that his speech is wahi, is revelation, is through divine inspiration. All of that is possible because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it to be there. And then of course you have the response, Rasulun min Allah. So the second ayah Allah says, he delivered the bayna, and that's in the form of a magnificent messenger who recites, yatlu suhufan mutahara, purify scripture. All right. And then there's a third issue. So now I hope I'm not losing anyone because the tafsir is getting very tough. This is probably the toughest ayah we're, we're ever going to tackle, right? That lam yakun kafaru min ahl kitab, right? So they were not going to believe, right? Those who disbelieve from the people of the book and the mushrikeen. But it says from al kafaru min. So if, if you consider Ahl al-Kitab, there are some Muslims, they, they, you know, this is a hot topic, especially if you, you know, follow what Muslims are saying online, you know, people, people love to call each other kafir, you know, among Muslims. So for, what about non-Muslims, right? So this is the more, for some people, they get joy from that, you know? So there are a lot of people who, for some reason, you know, they, I mean, it's a fact that, that the deen which is acceptable with Allah is Islam. But whenever we deal with individuals or people, we leave the judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we don't know the condition of that person. So even if a person says that I'm Christian, I'm Jewish, I'm agnostic, I'm whatever, we don't go based on what they say, right? What, what we know is that anyone, Allah says in the Quran, So if you say that Allah, or you believe that Allah is one of three, so you have committed kufr. But there are a lot of people who say that they're Christian, but in fact, their heart is inclined to the truth. Even though they say that, but that's because they don't know that there's another box. They don't know that there's another option, there's another truth. You know, and maybe Islam is not presented to them in the right way. They don't consider that as an option. So this plays into that topic because it says, Mina Lalina. So from. So you wouldn't say those who disbelieve from the, if you consider Ahl al-Kitab as kuffar, then it would be repetitive to say those who disbelieve from those who disbelieve, right? Because you think of a Venn diagram, so you have one circle and then you have another circle inside. So by definition, the circle that's inside has to be smaller. That it can be everybody. So then the meaning of the verse would be those who disbelieve from the people of the book, meaning not all people of the book are disbelievers. So this is also one of the views among uh, the Mufassirin. I also, as you can tell, I incline towards this as well. I think it makes the most, and grammatically, it makes the most sense. This is the most appealing grammatically and linguistically. Imam al-Ghazali, he has another explanation. He says that people were set in the, and, and, and this is the one that I think also makes the most sense in connection with that. He said that people were stuck in their ways. They were used to shirk and disbelief for generations. 
So there's certain learned behaviors, right, that people have done for generations and generations. And what Allah is saying here is that it takes bayina, it takes a very powerful sign. Some it, it takes something more than just telling them, like, oh, believe in Allah, the one, in order to get people away from their cu cu culture and traditions and, and what they're used to. So, so like bones, once they're set, it's very hard to move them, right? Because they're kind of fixed in their position, they're very painful. So Allah, by using munfakina, he's saying people are set in their ways. People, it's very difficult to move people. And Allah says they would have never left from kufr into guidance, except if something powerful came to them. And that powerful thing is al bayina which makes more sense because it means that the next ayah means that the Prophet is the Bayina who did cause the people to change their ways. I hope everybody's with me. Because otherwise, if you can take you can you can adopt the position that, that the people who disbelieve are so sad in their ways they never change. But then it doesn't make any sense. Because the next ayah is talking about the Prophet coming and he is al -Bayna. And we know that he succeeded in his mission. And it also doesn't make sense because in that ayah, it says that there are some people from Ahl al-Kitab who will not change their ways unless the Bayana comes, the clear proof comes. So then it also doesn't make sense because those who disbelieve why are we saying some people are different from others? So we're saying, oh, they're, di they're different from others because what does it mean? They just believe more? I mean, it, 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 it doesn't follow. The logic doesn't follow. The only way in which it really makes sense is if you're saying that these people actually did change their ways, but not from belief to disbelief, but from disbelief to belief. This is the only tafsir. And this is an opinion, by the way. This is, you don't have to accept it. But in my view, this is the only tafsir which makes sense, which is which is appealing linguistically and also in the context. So it took it shows that and, and it shows from this era how difficult it was for the Messenger to transform the society, and that people were very, very resistant to doing so. And it was a task that only someone can do it. The Quran, it separated nations, you know? I mean, look at how Islam transformed the world, it transformed the Arabic language. I mean, nowadays, when you say Egyptian, you're like, oh, Egyptians are Arab. Hundreds of years ago, they weren't considered Arab. Palestine was not considered part of the Arab world. You know, Asham, none of it, right? I mean, maybe a piece of Jordan, right? Uh, you would consider Arabia, Iraq. I mean, none of, none of these areas. All of these, I mean, it, it shaped history. And the, all of that happened because of the power of the message that was delivered by the Prophet Sallallahu so shaping nations, shaping history, and changing the hearts of the individual, which affected society on a collective level. And, you know, of course, there's an irony here, which is that, you know, they boasted about the, when the Ahl al-Kitab, a lot of them, they said, oh, when our messenger comes, then, you know, we're going to be saved and we're going to follow him. We're going to be wonderful. This is especially from the three Jewish tribes that were in Medina, Bani Qurayla, Bani Qayyuqa, Bani Nadir, the three tribes in Medina. They said, oh, our prophet is coming. They assumed that the prophet that was prophesied in their text was going to be a Jewish prophet. And then when the prophet came and actually was from Quraysh, so then they disbelieved in him. And actually... In order to truly appreciate this, you have to examine the word kafar, right? So kafar means to bury a seed deep into the ground and then to put lots of soil on top of it. Not just to push it, but bury the seed and to cover it with lots of topsoil and to plant something in the depths of darkness. That's what kafar means. And so it suggests that Allah is the one that brings the society from that darkness into the light. Right? Because, you know, kafara means to cover and to reject the truth. So that means you have to first receive it, and then you can reject it. It also shows a few things. One, which is that there are people with a good inside, which shows on the outside. Then there are people who have good inside, but they're affected by the society. So like Umar al-Khattab is a classic example. He was, you know, his corruption was a result of the society, but he had a, he had a good nature. Then there are people who everybody 
admired, but in fact was corrupt inside. Abu Jahl is an example of that, right? Abu al-Hakam, we talked about him last week. And then there are people who actually, they don't have any good in them. We can think of a few people in our society. Right? In their inward condition, their outward condition is the same. You can, you can, you know, they lay it all out there for everybody to see. So Abu Lahab is the classic example of somebody like that. So Surah Al-Anfal, if somebody's interested, this separation is, is, is mentioned. So Allah mentions there in the 42nd verse that it was so Allah would accomplish a matter already destined, that those who perish through disbelief would perish upon evidence. And those who lived in faith would live upon evidence. And indeed, Allah is all hearing and knowing. So the Bayana came, the Prophet came, and separated people, even within a family, within a society. And what this also suggests to us is that we should not be silent about the truth. Right? So Islam sometimes requires us to be vocal or to advocate to take a position. It doesn't mean to persecute anyone. It doesn't mean to uh, reject anyone. But what it means is that when we see injustices, when we see ignorance, when we see falsehood, then we should distance ourselves from that. And we should take a position on some issues, even if we're in a society which uh, advocates for you know, a very pluralistic way of, 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 um, of thinking in terms of pluralism and thought. And so it's it's this suggests in today's time, how does a Muslim reconcile that? Because we want to be open, we want to be tolerant, but what is the difference between being tolerant and being accepting? So you can accept the person, but you don't necessarily have to accept their value system. Because for the Muslim, the value system that we have adopted and that we are following is dictated to us by our deen, by the Quran. And so this requires maturity on the Muslims. Some people veer to one extreme where you know they're condemning. They're just they just they just love condemning everybody. So they get some kind of thrill out of that. And then you have other people who say, Oh, there are many paths to truth, you know, and we're all looking for the same thing. I mean, yes, I mean we're all looking for the same thing, but <laughs> some paths are going nowhere. Some of us are going straight to shaitan, right? So as a Muslim, we, I mean, why are we Muslim? We're Muslim because we think that this is the truth. And there's nothing uh, uh, politically incorrect about saying that. Because believe me, all the other religionists, they also believe that their path is the truth, okay? You're not going to offend anyone by saying, I really believe in Islam. You're not going to upset anyone in saying that. But of course, we're not, we're not condemning. That's not right. Here we say that 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 is Bayyuna. Does Bayyuna mean prophet, or does it mean the next ayah says Sa'afan or Zahada? Then it means the Quran. So which one is it? The, the, the clear message is prophet or or Quran itself? Right. So there, there are two views, uh, and really they're the same, I would say. One is that, um, and it's, it's actually this is the next point I was about to say, which is that the Bayana has two components. I would say they're the same. One is the messenger and one is the message. And, the, and in Islam, the fact that the Prophet is talking about the two together indicates that they're wrapped up in each other, that they are intertwined. Because Allah says, Rasulum min Allahi, he is a messenger min Allah. So Allah doesn't say Rasulullah. He says, Rasul, that he is a messenger from Allah, which means that the Bayana is the Prophet himself, right? That him as a person is part of the message, because if he says Rasulullah, then it would be the messenger of Allah, which would be the personality. But Allah says Rasulun min Allah, a messenger from Allah, it means the messenger Muhammad وسلم, himself and not his role is the Bayana. Yet, he recites the, uh, the purified scriptures. So it can mean the Quran or it can mean the Prophet. I would suggest we don't have to choose one because Allah mentioned both together. And so it's really the Prophet bringing the Quran. That combination is the bayan, not one or the other. Because it's not the Quran on its own and it's not the messenger on his own. It is the Messenger وسلم, coming with the Quran. So that combination, that combo together uh, makes the most sense. 
And you know, also the fact that Allah mentions the Prophet as a, a messenger from him, it also suggests that the bayina was powerful because the Prophet was walking the walk. He was actually living and embodying the message of the Quran. And that also, you know, should ask us that, you know, a lot of us were like, Islam is great, but Muslims are terrible. You know, this is like our, we need to work on our advertising, right? We, were talking, <laughs> we, need, a, we need a good marketing manager for Islam. <laughs> our marketing for the last couple of decades hasn't been on point, you know, um, if, if you think about it. Actually, by the way, since 9-11, public perceptions about Islam are at the lowest ever in history. And a Pew study, if anyone is interested, uh, Pew uh, Research Center, they have, they publish every few years they do, a, they do a survey and it shows the it shows the figures and how public perceptions about Islam and whether Muslims are violent and whether uh, Islam advocates for positive things or, or it is, uh, are uh, Muslims and, and Islamic values uh, compatible? What's Islam's view on women? All of these public perceptions have declined. And, it was easy in the beginning. We said, oh, it's, it's Hollywood. It's, you know, Hollywood was there before. It's still there. You know, it, it suggests that we're not doing a good job, right, of showing the public about Islam um, and, and, and showing that. Uh, one example that I think is very powerful is that it's very common among Muslims to, to say that Islam elevated the status of women. Has anybody heard that before? <laughs> I've heard it like a thousand times. <laughs> and we're like, oh, Islam honors women. And I was like, okay, Islam honors women, do you? <laughs> so this is, the, this, is the, this is the problem, right? There's a little bit of hypocrisy. You know, we, we go to the masjid and then and, and a lot of masjid, a lot of Islamic circles are like, no, 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 we don't need women to come. And, but then they will give a lecture to the men about how it's important to have like, good wives and good mothers, and I'm like, well, how are they gonna know if they didn't come to the masjid? <laughs> because you don't want them to come. So there's some contradictions, you know, where we talk about something in theory, and then we don't actually practice it, right? So in Allah says in Surah Qalam, which we talked about, that you are of great moral character. Yet, Tilawa, it means to follow. But what's interesting is the Quran did not come in the form of a book. So what is the Prophet said reciting, right? And so what the Mufassirin said is that the Quran was revealed on the heart of the Prophet And so he is reading the Suhraf and Mutahara, the purified scriptures from his heart. And so that's what he is reciting from. So it says Suhraf and Mutahara containing true scriptures, which indicates that there are lots of other wisdom and teaching that's within the Quran, and it's not only law which is in the Quran. Why? Because in Surah Al Muqarrah, so Allah says that it has right kutub, it has books that establish and and sets the society straight. Right. So that means that the that the Quran is mostly not law. We know that, right? The Sharia is less than 20% of the Quran is, is about rules. Most of it is about, some of it is about the after, but most of it is about how to be a good person. And, and, and out of that, the biggest chunk is about Iman, is about faith. And so the Quran also sets up the society, takes the crookedness and justices out of the society. Then Allah says, Yet those were given the scriptures became divided only after they were sent such clear evidence. So now this makes sense that this is talking about the people who didn't change. And that the first ayah, remember I told you my view is the first ayah is about the people who did change. So now this is different. Otherwise it's repetitive. Why are we saying the same thing? So this is different because the first ayah was talking being the bayina. Here there's an analogy about Isa ibn Umar being the previous one. So they were given clear evidence and they ended up more divided. They ended up, they differed with each other. So when first saying this, that this is about the people of the book, he came in order to unite them, but the result of Jesus coming was that they ended up even more divided. 
And so this is the opposite transition. Instead of from uh, darkness into light, they went from light into darkness. And this is also a warning about religiosity, right? Because religious knowledge can be very good if it brings you to the truth. But religious knowledge can also be a weapon. Shaitan can also manipulate us into, you know, thinking, you know, ego is very, very powerful, right? And religious people are not immune from ego, okay? In fact, sometimes we're, we're actually, there's a, there's a story that Imam Abu Hanifa at the end of his life, and Abu Hanifa was very, very famous in his life. There's some people who didn't really attain, uh, they were not truly appreciated while they were alive until later. Imam Abu Hanifa is not like that. He was world famous at the time. And he was sleeping one night and he had a dream. And in the dream, he hears a voice, very peaceful, beautiful dream that this is Allah. You have worshipped me faithfully your entire life. So now I don't want you to exert yourself. And why don't you just relax and take it easy? Right? And Imam and most of us we say, wow, this is an amazing dream. This is awesome. Allah talk to me. Imam Abu Hanifa, when he heard this, he is asleep. The man is like literally unconscious. And in his dream, he starts yelling and shouting. And he says, you are a liar and you are shaitan. And he shouts this in the middle of his dream. And he sees in his dream that the voice turns into a snake. And it was shaitan coming to him with a nightmare, trying to misguide him. And so shaitan gave up. He's like, I can't misguide Obi-Mu Hanifa. But it, the reason he told us the story, he said, even a person like me, I'm not immune from shaitan. Shaitan is still coming and trying to, to misguide me. But he's not going to Imam Hanifa being like, oh, why don't you steal that? Oh, why don't you commit this haram? You know, why don't you look at this haram image, right? So uh, shaitan is going to come to us with such low, lowly things. For the scholars, it's going to go according to their level. So th the temptation of, of, the, of the scholar is saying, oh, you're wonderful, you're amazing. If you don't teach this, who's going to do it? Nobody knows more than you. you know, that's the kind of stuff that gets to a person. And so you, especially when you attain to a certain level of respect and society. So this happened to Bani Israel, that when Jesus came, they became jealous and they refused to follow him because he took away from their authority. He's saying, follow me, don't follow them. And so that delegitimized them. Then in the fifth ayah, though they are all they are ordered to, and this is the essence of the surah. I love this, right? Though all they are ordered to do is to worship Allah alone. Hunafa, sincerely devoting their religion to him as people of true faith, keep up the prayer, pay the prescribed alms, for that is the true religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Christians and Jews and what are the things which comprise the essence of religion, right? What is, what really matters? So certain things. So Allah is talking about a lack of sincerity. The most important thing is being sincere, humbling yourself before the messenger. It also, Allah is indicating the human tendency to want to run away from authority. You know, I mentioned a few months ago, I said, you know, a lot of people complain about organized religion. But alhamdulillah, our, our religion is very disorganized. So we don't have that problem. <laughs> so Catholics, they're like, oh my God, we have to follow this, we have to do that, you know? And, and there's like a supreme authority they have to go through. As Muslims, you know, people are like, well, who speaks for Muslims? Nobody. And that can be a good thing. Because can you imagine if somebody, you know, if we had, you know, for example, you know, we're following the Sunni approach, the Shi'is, they, 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 they have a marja. So even on fit matters, they will have one mufti, it's a higher level than a mufti, who is going to make all of the rulings and you just have to follow that person. So they call it taqlid, right? So you just follow whatever that marja tells you to do. But, you know, even though we are following the four madhabs, it's not only four, but as long as in our approach, as long as you're following somebody who is qualified, who is a mujtahid, who, who has the requisite knowledge, so it's acceptable, right? You don't have to make it that rigid. Of course, don't make it up on your own. Right? So the fourth thing is that some people dislike following the sunnah out of ego. You guys have met some people who say, I only follow the Quran. And that is because it bothers them that why should I follow a human being? There's something about that that offends some people. 
that okay if it's from the quran then i'm going to believe it but if i you know so like even when you tell stories about the miracles of the process and this something they're like i never did the process i'm really going to do so and this is unbelievable to me and i'm like the evidence is like very very strong we have all these reports but people are like yeah but i still doubt it well you doubt it because it's it's hard to believe, which, which is true. It is hard to believe. A lot of the early Muslims said, oh, I don't believe that. You know, they, they kind of hesitated. They came back. We don't know who they were because they came back to Islam. So nobody in the historians, nobody mentioned their names. But there were some people who left Islam for a few days because they were really doubtful. They're like, this is unbelievable. How could he go to Jerusalem on this like heavenly burak? It's like some kind of unicorn. And then impossible. How is it possible? But in this one ayah, the whole deen really is encapsulated in a single ayah. The essence about being a good person, Allah, the rights unto Allah, the rights unto others. And then the word ibadah. So we talked about abd. So part of the problem in English is sometimes we say abd, we talk about like a worshiper. But ibadah has two angles. Part of ibadah is worshiping Allah. Part of it is ubudiyah. So part of it is being in a state of this, being a slave to Allah. And what, you know, we can translate it as a servant of Allah. But when you translate servant of Allah, you lose some of the meaning because it implies uh, some kind of contract. It implies that you are rendering some kind of service. It implies that there's some kind of reward. Whereas the relationship is between the Rabb and the Abu, between the master and between the slave. So meaning that this is part of your state of being is that ana abdullah, as Jesus says, right? Inni abdullah atani al-kitab wa ja'alani nabiyya, right? So Ibn Taymiyyah, he says there, there are five conditions to being the slave of Allah. One is you have to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two, um, you have to, uh, you cannot obey anyone else. La ta'ata li makhlukin fi ma'asiyat al-qadr. Three, and everything you do as a slave has to be for the sake of Allah. Four, to have dependence, tawakkul ala Allah. And five is that every party has to have responsibilities. So some people, they don't make the religion sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mukhlisin, the sincere believers, they are hunafa. That means they're inclined away from misguidance. They want to be upright and they're not distracted by other people. So as the Prophet he said, I was sent with the easy Hanafiya, with the Islamic monotheism, which means Islam, it comports with our fitah, our natural inclination towards the truth. And then the last major uh, theme we have to talk about, the sixth ayah, those who disbelieve will have the fire of the hell, which uh, actually we were just talking about this after Salat al-Aisha two nights ago, there to remain they're the worst of the creation. So the fate of those who after the bayana they chose to continue in their kufr are not in the same status of those who are just disbelievers. Why? Because they saw the Prophet they had, or in the case of the previous generation, they saw Jesus. They received the, the clear proof and they still persisted. Jahannam is actually a Farsi word and it means like a torture chamber. And Khalid Khuld, it means to remain somewhere permanently. And Bariya, it comes from Bara, like Allah is Al Bari, who originated everything. So they're in the fire of hell permanently because they are the worst of all of the people that existed. So the punishment also has to persist. Those who believe and do good deeds are the best of creation. So, of course, Allah mentions Iman, then He mentioned Amal. We've talked about that before. Their reward is with their Lord, everlasting gardens with streams where they will stay forever. Allah is well pleased with them and they with them. We talked about this. So, the fact that they're pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with them. But one thing, I won't repeat that since we spoke about it, but what's interesting is Allah is always talking about. There are waters in Jannah. Why this emphasis about rivers? And you might think like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm super educated, I'm sophisticated, you know, we're so fancy. But the reality is human nature is all the same. You know, everybody in real estate is looking for something with beautiful views. Everybody wants to be on a waterfront property. They want swimming pools, they want beachfront, they want nice lawns. And that's exactly what the description of Jannah is. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Jannah exactly with the things which are made appealing to us, exactly based on what our preferences are. And then um, if you're interested, there's, you know, the how come Abada is mentioned for Jannah? It's not mentioned Khalidina, they're there forever, but Ab Abada is not mentioned for Jahannam. So some people, they said, well, maybe Ibn Taymiyyah actually even uh, suggested that maybe the hellfire is going to end at some point. But this is not the majority view. I'm not convinced by it because there are other verses in the Quran that mention that it will continue forever. So why is it that in this verse, there's a lack of symmetry? So Abada is in Jannah, but it's not mentioned in Jahannam. And most of the Mufassirin, they said, actually, because Allah is emphasizing, in this surah, Allah is mostly talking about Jannah. And then he said, yeah, in the hellfire, there's also this punishment that never ends. So then when he's trying to emphasize it, so he's focusing your attention on Jannah. Right? And then in other cases, Allah does the opposite symmetry, where he talks mostly about the hellfire and then a little bit about Jannah. But the takeaway message from this, other than the main ayah we talked about, the fifth ayah, is that the ultimate, that the ultimate gift is Allah's pleasure with you. So you should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for its own sake, for Allah's pleasure and his satisfaction. And it's different from any other kind of slave. Because what satisfies you is for your master to be satisfied, as opposed to human beings. Human beings are never satisfied, right? As Imam Shafi said, <laughs> satisfying people is an objective which you're never ever going to achieve. It's impossible. So khashya means to fear and to worship something which is much greater than you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this takes us to Surah Zalzala. Um, this is very a much simpler surah. It can it, it a continuation of a lot of the other surahs we talked about before, dealing with the last day and refuting the deniers. And they had three main criticisms. And in the short surah, Allah addresses all three criticisms. First, how could the sky or the earth collapse and come to an end? We, every day we wake up, the sky is there, the earth is here. Right? Where is it going to go? Secondly, how could there be a record? And this one is especially offensive to some. How could everything be written, everything that we do? And third, even if we assume that these things are true, then we're still going to be safe because we have worshipped our idols who are going to keep us protected. So Allah is giving us a window into the psychology of shirk, how people think and how they justify ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reality is they cannot hide from Allah's anger. So zalzala is a root that has four letters. The Arabic letter normally has three letters. Kataba, Sajada, Jalasa, Radiya. This has Zalzala, which is not the norm. This is a fi'al wudai. It comes from Zalla, which means to slip. But Zalzala, that repetition shows something which is repetitive. Because Zalzala, right? So that shows that the earth is going to shake, then stop, then shake, then stop, and it will continue perpetually. This is similar to the word waswasa, waswasa, right? Which means whispering, right? Like the whispering from shaitan. So you would think that, okay, every time it stops, it will offer you some relief, but then as soon as it stops, then it starts again, which shows the repeating of, of the syllable, which shows that on the day of judgment, you know, you're dealing with everything that's going on above surface, and even the land that you're standing on is unstable. So it, it actually shows our emotional state on Yom al -Qiyam, that we will feel unstable, like we don't know what's going to happen. It, it shows the level of anticipation and confusion on the Day of Judgment, as Allah says in the beginning of Surah Al-Hajj, that uh, Allah uses the, the same word to say that the earth is going to shake. People will appear that they are intoxicated, but they are not actually intoxicated but they are not able to keep upright. So the surah begins with the beginning of the end, right? So it, it's talking about the last day, but it's talking about the first event of the last day. And then the passive voice is used, that the earth is shaken. So normally somebody would say, when I shake the earth, but Allah uses when the earth is shaken, which it seems very casual. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if the earth wants to shake, it wants to quake, and that Allah barely has to, that there's no effort involved in making that happen. And then it's repeated again, maf'ul mutlaq, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا So when the, right, the ضَرَبْتُ ضَرْبًا Right? I hit, that means I really hit really strong. It's called maf'ul mutlaq, when the word is repeated a second time. But the fact that it says zilzalaha, it means it's shaking, it's quaking, right? So it shows that this is going to be a very violent, a very incredible, a continuous kind of shaking. And then it also has the feminine ha, which goes back to the earth, the earth shaking. Which means that you can't run away from the earth to anywhere else because it's the earth that's shaking. And that means that it's not a localized, like an earthquake is in one area, but it means the whole, the entirety of the earth is going to be shaking. So there will be no melja. There will be no place of refuge for you to go. It also shows that it's a promise, right? It means that the earth's shaking, there's this idafa that means that, that's the earth shaking, that means the earth has promised Allah that is going to shake when its time comes. And it also sh shows that that's the fulfillment of its duty and its obligation and its destiny. That the earth was created for this event to happen. And that the earth wants that to happen. When the earth throws out its burdens, right? Um, which means to extract, to extract, to take something out, to, right? It also appears in the Quran, in Surah al Nazi'at. It means to take something out, وَبُرِّزَتِ الْجِبَالُ right? And then to place it in front of someone. Taradda means to put something which is unacceptable or degrading away. So these things that you would expect that would remain onto the earth, it all becomes expelled. That means all of the bodies over all the generations that have accumulated in the earth, they will all be discharged. All of the treasures of the earth, they will all be discharged. And imagine in this scene, no one is going to run towards it. No one is even going to care. The earth is getting loaded. You know, now people are crazy about accumulating wealth, gold, diamonds. People die for diamonds. How many people have died for, for that kind of wealth? But on the day of judgment, nobody, everyone will be indifferent. And so right now, the earth is getting loaded on the sins of people that have become saturated. Right? Some people, they say, oh, maybe it's a reference to pollution. It's also possible. Tahalla, tahalla, it means that comes from the word of like a mother who is delivering a baby, unloading, right? So it means like the earth wants to get rid of all of this garbage. And then finally it has some relief, right? And then this also gives mankind a taste of the things that they have not, because we're able to bury it. Now we like bury the truth. You want to get rid of it so you can hide it. But on the day of Yom al the day of exposition, everything becomes apparent. Then Al-Insan says, Malaha, what's wrong with it? What happened to it? So Al-Insan min al right? So humankind, that's why the word insan is mentioned. Nasya means to forget, right? And it means what is what were we forgetful about? We were forgetful of our own resurrection. So it's gonna stun him, right? So everyone will come. Each of us will come and appear on the day of judgment alone. And imagine that you're in this, because Allah is not using a mass that the people will cry. Allah is saying, a person will say. So it gives you this sense that here you are and you're completely alone in this gathering of billions and billions of people, but you have never been more alone than you are on that day of judgment. No space to move. I mean, literally, the hadith, authentic hadith from the Prophet is just a place for your feet next to each other to plant on the ground, and that's it. Everyone is going to be squeezed together. And then in Surah Yasin, Allah says, they will say, Ya waylana, man ba'athana min maqadina. Who is the one who woke us up from our sleeping place? So the, Allah is describing two different types of people. The person who's like, oh, we know what's happening because we heard about it in the Quran. So the believer knows what's happening on the day of judgment. When they hear the trumpet, when they wake up, they say, okay, we know what's happening. Our Nabi, he told us about this. But then there are other people who are confused. They don't know what's happening. Why are we awake? What's going on? What's next? So the disbelievers are the ones who are in the state of, of confusion. On that day, it will tell all. 
Yom Ma'id is a more dramatic, hyperbolized form, which indicates angrier. And it's also a warning. So on that day, it means like you're telling something, someone, that like as if they're hearing it for the first time. Right? And then to Hadithu, so the earth is going to speak, give every last detail. Right? So Allah says, we recited actually in Surah Al-Kahf, actually the Qari, he didn't reach that level, where they said, مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا وَلَا يُغَادِرُ رَبِّكَ أَحَدًا In Surah Al-Kahf, that, oh, woe to us, what is this book that doesn't leave anything small or great except it has enumerated it? And they will find everything that they did, Hadira, present before them. And your Lord does not do injustice. So Naba also means news. But here Allah says Akhbar. But Naba is something which could have never been known. So it means something, it could be something in the future, it could be past or present, but something which is unknown. But Khabar is something that you can figure out. So some people, they will say, to hadithu akhbaraha, they said, is there some kind of contradiction? And the, the way to reconcile this is that we'll come in contact with actions uh, when the earth speaks. And even though you know your deeds and your actions is going to be shocking. So even though you know what you did, it will be like you're seeing it for the first time. I can't, I really did that? Was that me? Play the footage. Do it in slow-mo. Because you won't believe that that's really you. And Ibn Mas'ud, he had the opinion that the earth is actually going to have a tongue and is going to speak on that day. But most of the Mufassirin, they said, no, that our Lord will inspire to. We talked about the Wahi before, so we'll skip that point, inshallah. On that day, people will come forward in separate groups to be shown their deeds, right? And whoever has done it, Adam's way, so, يعمل, so this is a conditional sentence. It could be with a with a page. But because of it means it's a jumla shawqiyya. It's a conditional sentence. That whoever did good and khair is very general. So Allah is keeping the most general word in the Arabic. Whoever did something which you know is good and shar is the most general word for evil. Whoever knows. So that means the human being already knows. What's good and what's bad? Yara. And yara, it doesn't mean, it's not like yango. Namara is something that you see with your eye. Yara means he sees it, it means you will understand it, you will realize it. So it's yara, ra'a, it doesn't normally have a literal meaning in the Quran. There are other words for basara, namara, that have a literal meaning in the Quran. So dharra is like a very small thing. Even the eggs of the ant, they're called dharra. So in today's terms, we would say an Adam's weight, the smallest uh, uh, thing, and whoever does an Adam's weight of evil will, will, will see it. And so in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with something huge. He talks about the whole of the earth shaking, this huge earthquake. And at the end of the surah, Allah ends with the smallest of the smallest speck, the Adam's weight. And this is the beautiful contrast of the surah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about all of humanity, and then he talks about the individual, he talks about the whole earth being shaken, and then he talks about even the smallest atoms weight. That is the thing, in, when this huge calamity, everything's happening at a grand scale, but the small khair that you did, the small kindnesses, the small good deeds that you did, those are the things that are going to save you on such a tremendous day. That's Those are the things which are going to make a difference, inshallah. So we'll take a few minutes. Of course, we have Salat al Aisha. We'll take a few minutes for questions. And also on Zoom, we have the chat open. So uh, please don't wait till then. Yes. Well, what's interesting is what you were saying with the burden, um, it's like you don't have good PR or yeah. Muslim. If you compare it to like the Catholic, the um, priests when they have the um, the Pope as speaker for the religion. In Islam, I think there's wisdom in the fact that you know we're all responsible directly for all our charges, so we are all responsible for the PR of the religion. And so you know, the Prophet was our example, but it's the burden is on each of us individuals.
So uh, for those following along, so the beautiful comment was about how because we don't have a book, we don't have anyone to speak for all Muslims, then the obligation is and duty is on all of us, uh, you know, to, to live in accordance with that and to and to you know be be a messenger, a positive messenger, you know, to others about Islam. I think that that's very important. Some people overdo it. They're like they become very sensitive about public perception and like. You know, it's like, you know, people are like, we need to clean the masjid, we have non-Muslims visiting, you know, okay, and like, you know, and then like masjids which are very closed off to women suddenly become very like, they welcome all the non-Muslim women. You're welcoming non-Muslim women to the masjid, what about Muslim women? <laughs> There's an element of hypocrisy in there uh, because we, it's like an over-obsession with public perception. If you, my view is that if you live your life in accordance with the Islamic values, and you are a genuinely good person, then people will notice that. And then, so you don't have to like bring the media because you're feeding the hungry, going to a soup kitchen. You can do it. And then if you want to promote that as well and highlight it so people can see that Muslims are doing it, that's a wonderful thing. I'm not discouraging that, but people will recognize it when you're, so, so it's not one or the other. You can do it for the sake of Allah and then you can highlight that so others are aware of it. Yes. Uh, I actually have two comments. Permit mm -hmm. me one for each surah. So, um, in Surah Bayana, it's actually interesting when it talks about, um, you know, making separation between those who disbelieve and those who change. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to point out that one of the attacks towards the Prophet Islam was that he was dividing the people, yes. right? That he was a separator. Mm -hmm. um, and Allah kind of like, uh, I don't know, I guess reverses that criticism is like, yeah, I am separating, but I'm separating the rot from those amongst mm -hmm. you who are like pure. You know, like Umar bin al Khattab mm -hmm. is not Abu Jahl. Abu Bakr is not, you know, Abu Lahab. You know, Let so me mention it for, for the people on Zoom. This is a beautiful mm -hmm. comment. It's one of the very, very important tours. You said it better than me. Um, is, is refuting the people who are criticizing the Prophet for dividing the society. That there is a difference between Umar and Khattab. Allah says in the Quran, "Li amiz Allah min khabitha min al-tayyib." So Allah distinguishes the rot from that which is beautiful. Right. So it's exactly like what you said. And then uh, with regards to uh, Surah uh, Zalzala, right? Um, with regards to doing an Adam's way of good, um, it kind of ties back to what the Prophet Allah says about intention. You know, inna mala manu biniyat. Right. Actions are by intentions. Um, and you know, in the real world, that's not how things work, right? Like everything is by results. You know, you're not gonna get that promotion if you don't make any sales. It's like, oh, you know, but actions are by intentions. You know, let me get a bonus. But you know, that doesn't happen. And um, you know, you were talking about doing good, but it can also conversely if you look at the other way, right? Like, even if you like um the example I'm thinking of is like, let's say um you're doing salah, right? Like your wudu might be trash, your mind kind of wanders during mm -hmm. namaz, but if the, so 99% of your namaz might be horrible, mm -hmm. but then you got that 1% that's good. You know, that's why we say at the end of the salah, mm -hmm. right? Like, not the right? Mm -hmm. May Allah accept from us. So even that 1% of good, you know, Allah still accepts from that. So, yes, I, mean. that it's, it's a, I think this surah is a very powerful motivator <laughs> for people who are, who feel that their good deeds are insufficient. Yeah. Because then it makes you feel like, oh, I didn't do much, so it shouldn't even count. Or it's like not noticeable, it's not big enough, you know, or like somebody who's discouraged, you know, I can't, there's too many, too much suffering in the world. So what difference am I going to make? But Allah sees every, everything that you do. Um, there's a question that, uh, that came up. How do we effectively deal with the hypocrisy of treating women well as the decision makers are mainly male in the home? Uh, sister, you haven't been to my house. And in the... <laughs> <laughs> the decision making part of my brain is shut up and in the massage <laughs> women sometimes are not heard that this is an epidemic among muslims in america uh, you know the men they're not in charge of anything at home so they come to the masjid to boss women around it's true you know, I, i'm joking but i'm really serious you know so the the, the, the big people, the very nice people, they come to a message, they become crazy, you know, and when they have a little bit of power, they become very abusive and very angry. And I'm like, brother, you were so nice before you became on the message board. What happened? 
you know, because it's an ego thing. Shaitan does that to some, and he did. That's why this responsibility is not for everyone. There are some people, mashallah, who discharge those duties in such a beautiful way. And when they do it, you can see that um, and support it in the home and outside. I think the, uh, on, on this topic about um, Im improving the position of women in the masajid, I think it requires us to think outside of the box we, what, we, what we dream of. So some people they ask the question, so, okay, well, why don't we have like a woman leading the Jumu'ah, leading this? And, and before we get to that point, what about utilizing the skill that we already have among women? We might have female, especially in this area, there might be some female scholars. Why do we need a man teaching Quran to other women if we have uh, women who can do that? So uh, similarly, I mean, our Sunday school would not operate uh, most of the teachers are women. So as a community, collectively, the future of our men and the future of our, of our women are intertwined, right? Because Allah says in the Quran that the believing men and the believing women are awliya They are supporters of each other. So as soon as we set up the dynamic as a competition, then we are against each other then it becomes counterproductive. So it actually requires collaboration, it requires a collaborative approach, which means the men should be more understanding and men generally are not that good at listening, right? Um, and that, and that you know, especially from women, um, there are studies that support this, right? Um, and that's something that we can work on as a community, we can listen to what their concerns are, but then also from the ladies, they can do the same. And we can discuss things, inshallah, in a productive way. And that only happens when the men and the women are at the same conversation. They're at the same table, making the decisions together. That's why we should see in Masajid that women are part of the decision-making process. I think this is a healthy thing, inshallah. And then we see that with generations, it's going to change. Um, so there's another question about the reference to Adam's way. So Allah says, يعمل, whoever does, this is a, a conditional statement, the weight of an atom. And the reason that dhabra is used is because it was the smallest thing that the Arabs were. If you ask the Arabs at that time, is there anything smaller than dhabra? They would say, no, that was the smallest thing. So we are translating it as atoms because they didn't have that word atom. It's actually dhabra, it originally means the egg of an ant. And that was the smallest thing that they could they could think. Like in Surah Luqman, it said, Mithala, it talks about Mithala dhabra, which means the weight. But Allah says, Min khardal. So Allah says the mustard seed, right? Because that's something very small. But dharra is smaller than that. This is the Adam's weight. Um, and then from Sunday school, if it's taught mostly by women, would it not follow that the principle be female as well? But you don't see that as much. You can have my job, Bismillah. You can just relax. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the reality is that we need a Muslim society in which we should be concerned with the most qualified person doing the job. And if that is a woman, then the men should encourage that. Like for example, if we have a great scholar and, and she's female, as men, we should welcome her to, to speak and to teach us and we should, we should not have any resistance to learning from her. So what we want, what we aspire to inshallah as a Muslim society is that the most qualified people can do every job. Sona is, is unique. And this is the only exception because in a mixed gathering, women can lead the salah of other women. There's no issue whatsoever. Very, very few scholars uh, disagree. Most of all the scholars, they said that this is absolutely fine. It should be encouraged. But when we have a mixed gathering of men and women, so it should be a male leading the salah. Other than that, you know, the, everything is open, inshallah. We can, we can look at the situation. We can go based on that, inshallah. And I think this would be the last one. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, so as good as you're bringing up, you're talking about push, mushrik and the people who did not believe, uh, yeah, did not believe in Allah, did not believe in Allah, and Quran. And those people committed a lot of sin, uh, obviously, and they were not perfect uh, in doing the good things. And in the, in the second surah, it says, those who have done a little bit of wrong things, mm -hmm. they will be punished. And given uh, jaza accordingly, and those who have the good thing, they will be also rewarded. Now, those people who have been doing bad all their life, and suddenly they got desire, and they got guidance, they would be, no matter what they do, they were still going to be done. Um, so, you know,
sort of uh, doesn't add up. Here. Well, for those who, who, who change themselves, there is two situations. So for the person who embraces Islam, right? Amr ibn Khalid ibn al-Walid is the most famous story that he came to the Prophet and he said, I want to make bay'ah to you ala shart, on a condition. And the Prophet said, what is the shart? What is the condition? He said, I want you to first ask Allah to forgive all of my sins. And the Prophet mentioned three scenarios. And he said, did you not know that the one who enters into Islam, then all of his sins are forgiven. And we know the hadith because the Prophet also mentioned about Hajj, that the Hajj in Mabrur, you know, it also wipes away all of the sins. So this is number one, if somebody wasn't Muslim and then they change, but also for the Muslim who is in a state of ghafla, heedlessness, and comes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah can accept that tawbah. And the person who does repentance is in a better condition than they were prior to committing the sin. The reason for that is somebody commit, here's the time when they commit the sin, they feel nadam, they feel some regret that I shouldn't have done that. Then the person asks Allah to, for repentance, they make a clear dedication that I'm not going to back to that. Then they separate themselves from the sin, they prevent any possibility of committing that sin again, and they persist on staying on the path of guidance. Once they do that, this original sin is wiped out, it's canceled. So it's not on the mizan of, 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 uh, of evil deeds. It's not on the scale anymore, right? And on the, the good khair, the, the good deed that they have is that they have the reward of the tawbah. So this, uh, these ayat should not discourage anyone. If you have some sins, so then you can wipe it out and you can get an additional reward. So the person who does tawbah and repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually in a better state with Allah than they were previously. So this is why actually these verses should be a source of hope for us rather than something discouraging. I think with that, inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah that he will make our scales of good deeds heavy, that Allah will uh, put our uh, book in the right hand and Allah will enter us into al-Firdaus al-A'la in the Jannah for the highest. Uh, levels of Jannah. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد وآله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. بارك الله فيكم.